get started in a moment. I do want to start this morning with a little disclaimer as we now move uh, into talking about uh, discussing different issues. The issues that we'll discuss are certainly ones that uh, can be very divisive and there's strong opinion about. And so I want to just make sure you know that the uh, views and opinions that, that I express are my personal ones as a pastor uh, who cares for uh, you as, as our congregation, as our church family. They don't, uh, they are not the views of our board or of our church or of our larger denomination. And their whole purpose is just that we would be thinking, that we would be really spending time uh, together thinking and wrestling with these issues and that they would promote uh, healthy thought and discussion followed by, and remember, it's called TAP. It's not think and ponder. It's called think and prayer. And so that our unity would come in, not in that we would all come to the same agreement or the same destination in our thoughts, but that we would come to the same destination in who it is that we pray to and, and seek help. And remembering that we, uh, from a biblical worldview, believe that God is the one that's sovereign and we're the ones that are both sinful and um, are prone to error. And so I just want to make that disclaimer that the purpose of this is that we would have good discussion and good thought and then go together in prayer. So the topic for today, and we'll be discussing lots of different topics, uh, is the COVID-19 kind of pandemic response. How do we as Christians respond to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? That is our topic for today, and there's much that can be said about this. I'm sure that you are probably uh, to some degree tired of talking about it. Maybe not. Maybe you're still enjoying going round and round on the same thing over and over again, but uh, if you're like me, you're about ready to get off uh, this merry-go-round and, uh, and move on with life, probably. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that there is obviously this uh, cold virus that is um, sweeping the world that is very contagious. We know that. There's a couple of things that we do know uh, that it's important for us to just acknowledge, and that is that while it is contagious and airborne, uh, the mortality rate seems to be lower than we originally thought a year ago. And so that's good. The problem is even with a low mortality rate, if there's lots of people that have it, that means the death toll rises. And that's really the ethical situation that the world finds itself in today is how do we deal with such a, uh, a cold virus that is so contagious. And uh, while it may not be, um, the mortality rate may be low, with so many people getting it, it does create a large death toll. So that is the challenge that we face. I don't really want to get into the debating of the science and all of that behind it. Instead, I'd like to turn our attention to how this has created both uh, division and, and problems for us uh, societally in dealing with this. We remember that in the context of kind of a secular humanist versus a biblical worldview, we left off last week saying that our ultimate hope makes a great deal of difference in how we deal with things. And so I just saw a pastor post uh, kind of a meme that reminded people that, you know, our ultimate hope is that not that we don't get COVID or that we don't die, it's that we are one day going to be with Christ in heaven. So from a biblical worldview, the great tragedy is not that someone would die of a disease. We certainly have had that for some time. That's nothing novel about that, but that you would die without knowing Christ, that you would be eternally separated from God. That is the kind of the great tragedy. But in a secular humanist perspective, if you don't have that, if your great goal is to reduce human suffering, then, uh, and I think we've seen this in the last year, there is this fixation on, on the, the real problem is the COVID-19. It is the disease itself and how it creates suffering in the world and suffering for people. And that we as a larger society are responsible to help minimize that to the best of our ability with the resources and the science that we have. And so there is a little bit of a difference sometimes in, in how we deal with where we have the same issue before us, but we're dealing with it quite often different people from different perspectives. And this is probably highlighted the most if you look on our notes in that middle place. When we talked a couple weeks ago but between the church and the state. And so you have this conflict between the government, which, you know, for a secular humanist is the ultimate authority, and for a biblical worldview, the church is the ultimate authority, that God is the ultimate authority. And so these two groups of, of people are coming into conflict. And I have a very uh, good friends who are pastors 
you know, who would look at, for example, the way in which uh, our church is responding in having services and open services um, as uh, being negligent to kind of uh, our testimony to the world of caring. In other words, they would say, listen, what you're putting first is people's freedom to worship the way they want, and you're putting that over the greater collective good of people's health and people's safety. And that is a bad testimony in the world by putting your own individual rights above loving your neighbor. So that's uh, a perspective that I think is out there. And so they would argue that the best thing the church can do is to uh, get on board with the state mandates in order to help try to protect people as best as they can. Because we know that gathering in groups, you have greater risk for disseminating of uh, of airborne illnesses and communicable diseases. So, so that's that's one side, and I want to kind of respond to that this morning to um, to some degree. Um, there's a couple of assumptions that are made in in that, and that is that uh, what is best or most loving for our neighbor is that which what the state is doing in order to stem uh, the disease, and and and. That's a gray area. It's a difficult area. I don't have this super confidence this morning to say, oh, well, we've done everything right, and th- you know, this perspective is, is the absolute truth. I think that a little bit of humility uh, would go a long way in understanding that, that we don't always act in what's best um, uh, for larger society in general. And uh, as individuals, we can be selfish and do things which put other people in harm. And so... Um, there is this kind of false dichotomy that says that you know one group has the answer and the other group doesn't, and so it's just this fight to see who's going to win win out the battle, which really leads me to two things that I'd like to discuss this morning, or at least kind of place before you, and they're the two red flags. Uh, the first one's probably not quite red, but maybe maybe a little bit orange or, or amber in color, uh, but it is the, the topic of censorship. And when the state has ultimate authority and its purpose is to protect people and to keep them healthy and safe, uh, there's some assumptions there that in order to do that, they have to uh, have conformity from the group. And that is difficult. That's where a lot of times people begin to have the debate about individual liberty versus uh, acting as uh, a commune uh, um, in community. Uh, and so we're always having those discussions and we're always making decisions in regards to that uh, on, a, on a pretty regular basis. And it's very much heightened in, over the last year with the topic where we all have one singular thing to focus on, and that is this one particular uh, disease. And so uh, with that has come, and, I, and like I said, uh, a concern that I have is that within both government and then uh, the way in which we engage is m- with media, even over things like YouTube and Facebook, and um, that there tends to be this kind of conventional wisdom that gets decided this is the way we're going. And then in order for us to go that way, there's a stamping out of dissent, um, kind of a silencing of people, because the idea is that in order for this to work, if people are dissenting and then they begin to create a a following with a different opinion of how we should go, that then challenges the authority of the state and creates uh, conflict and problems and could potentially be damaging to people. Um, And so there is this tendency of of everybody in power to want to censor or stifle speech, which is in opposition to its authority. And so I would just say that I don't want to go into in great detail. It's just a kind of an orange flag. I think we want to be careful in society uh, that we are not following kind of a common wisdom and w- with a great deal of trust in, in ruling authorities as though all their actions are always what is best for people, what is most loving, and what is the best help. Um, and, uh, and, we'll g- and, and we'll get into that in the second thing, which is, uh, I think, somewhat problematic, and I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about this idea of a new, a new ethic. 
Uh, but I would just say, be, ca be careful. We need to be cautious about this idea of censorship uh, within society. It can be somewhat uh, dangerous. Well, let's take a look at the, the first thing that happened almost a year ago now, uh, last April, that, that kind of sent red flags up, and I, and I haven't sensed this going away, is that we developed a, a new form of ethic, and which often happens when you have an authoritarian state, and I don't want to be uh, over-speak. I don't think that we are living under an authoritarian state, but when you have government as being the ultimate authority, there has to be an ethics which, which drives people to behave in the way that they do uh, in order, and, and that behavior in line with what are the mandates that are before us, whether that's, you know, the, probably the most obvious for us all that is, is face mask wearing, right? It's this, there's a, there's a new ethic that is surrounded with that. And these kind of things have always been in society, but never have they been more like on display in which we had to wear something and that we were immediately judged on an action uh, that we have been taken uh, so, um, so clearly. And so with that ethic, uh, and, and this came early, there was a sign that, uh, that was on the side of the road. I don't know if you remember it, but it, you know, it said like, you know, follow basically the, the gist of it was follow the governor's orders, stay safe, save lives, right? Okay, so that's fine, follow the governor's orders, stay safe. But saving lives, boy, that's a hard one for me to deal with. It brought me back to being a kid and hearing Smokey the Bear say only I could prevent forest fires. And I thought, man, that's a lot of pressure on a kid. Like, how, how am I the only one, you know? I, but there is this sense in which, uh, you know, ethics, how we behave, um, is driven by this sense of power that we have. And, w and uh, my concern came in that you, we would tell little kids, for example, we can't go visit grandma and grandpa because we don't want to kill them. As if a child had the responsibility to not kill their grandparents with the disease that they may or may not have, and certainly they didn't even know. And so we need you to wear this mask and we need you to take serious these things because your actions, if you are... If you fail, if you don't follow certain things, could result in the death of, of an elderly person. And I go, that's a lot of pressure to put on kids. It's a lot of pressure to put on a pastor. Uh, and in fact, it's a new form of ethic that we haven't had in the past. And we need to recognize that when new ethics start to pop up, that we don't rush in and go, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, um, the... Uh, the, the inability to clarify between something like manslaughter, which some of us are aware of, and taking that uh, idea of manslaughter, which if you guys remember, you guys remember Brian Regan, I slaughtered a man. It's, it sounds really bad, but it's actually different than murder. So if you commit manslaughter, you haven't actually murdered somebody. And there's this great distinction between intent, that somebody has to be, intending to kill somebody to commit murder. And if they're just stupid and make a mistake and are dumb and are negligent and it costs somebody's life, then they have to pay. They've committed somewhat of a crime, but it is not the crime of, of murder. And in the same way, we just take that ethic to say, well, if you are negligent in, in following the government orders and somebody gets a disease and they die, then you are ultimately responsible. And we've had things like you know, threats of lawsuits uh, to, you know, of, to churches, because if you break governor's orders and somebody dies, then it's the ultimately the church's fault. And, and so I would just say that's a huge red flag in, in changing ethics, and we need to be very cautious when we begin applying those ethics. So I'll give a couple examples of how this took place uh, over the last few years. A couple months ago, we were on a conference call with uh, pastors and one of the pastors was asking questions about how they could run a, a funeral, and um, and it was told they could only have 35 people at the funeral, and we ran into this, and and it was said very matter-of-factly that, well, uh, that religious services you could have up to 200, but funerals only 35, what's the difference? And like I said, matter-of-factly, it was just stated the governor doesn't consider funerals to be religious services, and my I just shook my head. I thought, well, when does he get to decide whether a funeral is a religious service or not, right? And, uh, 
And so we need to, those things need to, when, when something like that happens and, and our conscience is kind of pricked and we kind of go, wait a second, there's something that's wrong. We need to be careful that, that, that we don't just move on and say, well, it's, you know, the ethic is to obey the governor, right, or the government. The ethic is to ask ourselves, okay, what is it that God demands of us? And, uh, and so I think that that is an example of where you have some people say, well, the church is under the state and is responsible to the state versus my inclination is to say, wait a second, the state doesn't have the authority to determine whether something is religious. In fact, as Christians, we are, a lot of what we do is very religious. And it leads to this question is that, uh, is why would the governor make that statement? Well, he makes that statement because he is not ultimately seeking the, I mean, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say this. I don't know this for a fact, but I would assume the governor has not come out and at any point that I know of, if, if heard, has claimed the Bible as his source of authority. Now, he has claimed what? Science. And, uh, and historically, this is, again, I didn't put it as a red flag, but it, it, it affects, it's in the, the category of the new ethic, is that science is the study of what is. It's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's very helpful for us. It helps us to understand things like viruses and how they work and how they spread and how they affect the body. And, and, and it gives us information on how we can treat them. But what science doesn't tell us is what ought. So what is versus what ought. How we ought to act has never been something that science is particularly good at because it, it involves the issue of morals. It, it involves the issue of ethics. And when we begin to just say, well, science tells us this, and now we then move into ethics with ease, we need to be very careful. There's uh, the human race over the last hundred years has gotten themselves into terrible situations by moving from science into what ought to be and how people ought to act. And that's where I think the separation of church and state is very, very important because where we derive our ideas of how we are responsible to each other and particularly to God does not come from the state. It comes from God's word. And as the, as the church loses its influence in this area and as people turn more to the state, we are going to keep finding these issues, uh, not only impacting how we respond to things like a pandemic, but all kinds of other uh, issues as well as we kind of continue to talk. So pay attention to censorship, pay attention to new ethics, pay close attention to how uh, we respond to things and what is right and what is wrong. Let me just close real quickly and then we'll a ask a couple questions. If you haven't filled out the, uh, go ahead and, and fill out the poll today. I see a handful of people have done that. And so, um, so, uh, how do we respond? Well, let's go back to little, uh, the, the little girl who, or the little boy who doesn't want to kill their grandma. That's the new ethic, right? You have, your behavior has an influence over whether or not your grandma lives or dies. First off, I would say don't tell your kids that. God is the ultimate decider. If someone gets a disease and they die, we have, that is not uh, the ethic of, well, I killed them. That's not how you actually commit murder, just uh, so you know. Uh, but when that decision comes between um, a person having the ability to decide uh, whether or not to go visit grandma, uh, there's a couple things that we need to recognize, and that is that grandma uh, is a free will, has a free will. She maybe needs to decide what is more important to her, the risk of getting COVID-19 or the need for seeing and hugging their grandkids. And each person is going to make a different decision. They're going to attack that in a different way. And uh, in free society, that is very important to us. That's actually an important aspect to our will. The safety that the state provides is never as helpful for us as human beings because we are not simply animals. We are spiritual beings that, that our will is very important to us. And we have different needs. And so... Uh, the loving thing is not always necessarily to keep someone safe. Sometimes the loving thing is to provide them with freedom, uh, especially when that freedom is more important to them than the perceived safety. And so the reason that we maintain, for example, an open church service and invite people in is we believe that 
that actually the, sometimes the best thing for somebody may not be that they are not exposed to a potential harmful communicable disease, uh, but that they need to come to hear God's word being preached. They need to sing. They need to participate in community. And that the loving thing is to allow them as a, as a human being to make that decision, that they can weigh both the science and they can weigh and make decisions on their own. And so it's actually sometimes more harmful or hurtful to tell somebody, you don't know what's best for you. Let me do what's best for you. Um, because that's your greatest good is to stay alive a little bit longer. And, uh, and we need to be careful that we don't introduce a new ethic that says, I can tell you what is best for you because I've determined it by, uh, by my understanding of you know, the least amount of suffering that you will endure is my greatest ultimate good. So um, that's my thoughts. Uh, that's why we continue to stay open. I think that you can, you can reverse that. There's a new ethic that, that came about in the last hundred years it, within churches that can say, well, you know what? If you get a disease, we believe, and, and by the way, it always comes bad, down to really bad theology, a bad understanding of who God is. So in the case of this, not acknowledging God will lead us to allow science to tell us what we ought and what we ought not to do. Uh, you can also have a bad view of God that says that God says he does not want you to suffer. In other words, he, his purpose for you is that you would not get the COVID-19, that you would not suffer. And so if you get it and now you're suffering, then that must be something you've done. You have lacked faith. And so we can tell people, you know, that if you don't have faith, then and that's why you're staying home and th that you're in fear. And, and, and so there's this ethic of exposing yourself to sickness is a more moral thing than because it demonstrates this level of faith or spirituality that, that, you, that others don't have. Again, we don't want to, we don't believe that. We, we think that the ethic that, that we preach is that we are frail and feeble human beings. We're prone to disease. We're prone to error. We're prone to pride. And so uh, each of us in humility should come before the Lord and ask him to give us guidance and wisdom. And we won't remove somebody's ability to both stay at home and connect over online or their ability to come and gather as they see fit. And, uh, and, and then we allow God to be God over some of those things that we can't control and we don't always uh, know. So there's, that's kind of our thought, my thoughts. If we go to the next uh, slide, uh, uh, here's our discussion question for today, and we'll spend just a few minutes uh, asking the question, are you responsible? I think this is the ultimate ethic that question that I have over the last year. Are you uh, responsible for communicating a disease you may or may not have? And then two, what other ethical dilemmas have you seen or experienced this past year? Um, while you do that, I'm going to... In, uh, Go ahead, if you're online with us, throw up a question or a comment on Slido, and, um, and we'll go from there. Yeah? Yeah, you can discuss it here. We can just talk about it. Yeah. And for people who are joining online, you can always... You guys can talk, and I'll just repeat it so people can hear. Are you guys? What was your? What's your initial? We don't have to discuss it a long time, but what do you think that you are uh, responsible for communicating a disease you may or may not have? No, no. Okay, we're in. We're in unanimous. Throw up on if you think yes or no on Slido. Uh, by the way, if, if you're joining us online, we were just discussing, and it was being stated that we've run into that new ethic of people feeling like, oh, Grandma, I don't want to give you 
and get you sick. And, uh, and so this mask kind of provides this feeling of security that that's going to keep that from happening. And, and that's uh, sometimes I'd rather just see somebody's face and take my chances, especially if, especially if you know, there, we've already have this basic understanding that we live with communicable diseases, right? I mean, it's not like this is something new. Years ago, Heidi would ask me when I get home from church, could you wash your hands? Because you've just touched like like half of the valley, right? I mean, uh, and I'd go, no, that's the way I'm going to, you know, stay healthy. And I'd touch my eyes and lick my hands and be like, because I'm the uh, brilliant enough to know if I can't see it, I'm not afraid of it. So that's, that's the way I, I, I roll. All right, so what are some other ethical issues that have come up in the last year that seem new or a little bit off? Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. So let me just sum up what uh, Jeff was sharing is just that feeling that a lot of what I think has happened in terms of uh, the way in which we've responded to COVID is accumulation of a changing kind of culture ethic uh, over time that has a, a greater emphasis on safety, maybe over uh, what we would traditionally see as um, foundational principles of liberty or freedom. And we become less and less kind of comfortable with that chaos and we want conformity. Um, and so uh, I, I think too, Jeff, just on, on that point, uh, it, it's a shift in a culture where, and I think it's important for the church, uh, that the church has, has lost its place uh, historically as being kind of the where you go to find out what I ought to do. And, uh, and it is often not tends taking its cues from the larger society. In other words, most of our children find out what they ought to do from uh, rappers and, and TV personalities and influencers. And, and I think that, you know, I've grown up in a, in a church that seems desperate trying to get people's attention. And, um, and we find ourselves, it's, it, it can be kind of discouraging. Um, and so it's hard to compete in, in the world when I think we've lost that. So, um, yeah, other thoughts? Okay. Yeah. I think there is that change in, in how we consume media and also that, that feeling that when, when you start feeling that drum beat of like it's the same thing here, 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 it, you know, there's part of us that feels a little skeptical, like it can't be that, that easy um, or that clear. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things is this corruption, and uh, at all levels, I mean, corruption. It, human nature is corrupt. I think that's one of the the challenges um, as a Christian is 
is uh, is to acknowledge that th that's human nature is is corruption and uh, my observation is like when I think of for example the challenge of people conforming in order to protect society. It could be mask wearing. Well, it's difficult because you have to have a law because people aren't going to wear masks if you don't make them wear masks. But then when you make them wear masks, then they're like me and they're so bad at it that you wonder, you know, why it's not working. And so that's, uh, and that's where ethics has to come in in order to try to convince people in a certain way. And I, I don't want to, you know, I realize mask wearing is, is somewhat of a, uh, of a, you know, divisive discussion. Uh, but I only use, uh, use it in the sense that um, the question becomes how do you get the masses to, to conform and because we don't trust our neighbor. And the reason we don't trust our neighbor is we, we, we walk next to him in, in the store and they're wearing a dilapidated mask that is doing nothing to help, right? In other words, they're doing the bare minimum, and we go. There's just not. A th they're not following. You know the health standards that that we need to to do. That is indicative of somebody who cares about the larger community. And and the problem that I have is not that my neighbor is corrupt. Right, it's that my neighbor and the people in charge. It's the same group of people. You know that 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 part of free society is the acknowledgement that there is corruption. And that humans are corrupt, and and that there is certain things we don't solve, we cannot solve as people, this side of heaven. We're going to have diseases and die. And so, when we, when, as a as a believer, as a Christian, when I, if I get coronavirus, which I'm assuming I will at some point, and it eventually, if, if it if I react badly to it and it kills me, at the end of the day, my hope is that. This is God's purpose and will in my life, right? I have something beyond that. So it takes some of the fear out of that because there's something on the other side. But we live in a society that there is nothing on the other side. And so even if I get cancer, because, I mean, ultimately, that's the logic. It's like, well, if I don't get corona, I'm going to get cancer, right? And, uh, and I often wonder in, in you know, I, I scratch my head when I think, Oh, we must keep everyone alive. For what? So that they can die a really long, drawn-out death at the end? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have the experience. I don't wish anyone ill or, or death, but all of us have walked with people who are at the end of their life. And as sad as it is, you know, our hope is in something beyond that. Uh, but in secular society, all we have is science. All we have is, well, we just need more research, we need more science to solve it. And maybe we couldn't solve it with this person, but maybe for the next person, they can have two or three extra years. Maybe we can get up 10, 15 years. In a, and, and so that's the danger. And I think that's where we need to, as Christians, to remember where our hope is. And that at some point, people, having lived in fear, having lived without that hope, um, the church has to, to step in and, and preach with boldness, um, the gospel, which is that there is hope for us. So um, 